I'm a search and rescue officer for the U.S. Forest Service. I have some interesting stories to tell. I wasn't sure where else to post these stories, so I figured I'd share them here. I've been an SAR officer for a few years now, and along the way I've seen some things that I think you guys will be interested in. I have a pretty good track record for finding missing people. Most of the time they just wander off the path or slip down a small cliff and they can't find their way back. The majority of them have heard the old stay where you are thing and they don't wander far. But I've had two cases where that didn't happen. Both bother me a lot and I use them as motivation to search even harder on the missing persons cases I get called on. The first was a little boy, who was out berry picking with his parents. He and his sister were together, and both of them went missing around the same time. Their parents lost sight of them for a few seconds, and in that time, both the kids apparently wandered off. When their parents couldn't find them, they called us, and we came out to search the area. We found the daughter pretty quickly, and when we asked where her brother was, she told us that he'd been taken away by the bear man. She said he gave her berries and told her to stay quiet, that he wanted to play with her brother for a while. The last she saw of her brother, he was riding on the shoulders of the bear man and seemed calm. Of course, our first thought was abduction, but we never found a trace of another human being in the area. The little girl was also insistent that he wasn't a normal man, but that he was tall and covered in hair, like a bear, and he had a weird face. We searched the area for weeks. It was one of the longest calls I've ever been on, but we never found a single trace of that kid. The other was a young woman who was out hiking with her mom and grandma. According to her mother, her daughter had climbed up a tree to get a better view of the forest, and she'd never come back down. They waited at the base of the tree for hours, calling her name, before they called for help. Again, we searched everywhere, and we never found a trace of her. I have no idea where she could possibly have gone. Because... Neither her mother or grandma saw her come down. A few times, I've been out on my own with a canine, and they've tried to lead me straight up cliffs. Not hills. Not even rock faces. Straight, sheer cliffs with no possible handholds. It was always baffling, and in those cases, we usually find the person on the other side of the cliff or miles away from where the canine had led us. I'm sure there's an explanation, but it's sort of strange. One particularly sad involved the recovery of a dead body. A nine-year-old girl fell down in an embankment and got impaled on a dead tree at the base. It was a complete freak accident, but... I'll never get over the sound her mother made when we told her what had happened. She saw the body bag being loaded into the ambulance, and she let out the most haunting, heartbroken wail I've ever heard. It was like her whole life was crashing down around her, and a part of her had died with her daughter. I heard from a ER officer that she killed herself a few weeks after it happened. She couldn't live with the loss. I was teamed up with another SAR officer because we'd received reports of bears in the area. We were looking for a guy who hadn't come home from a climbing trip when he was supposed to, and we ended up having to do some serious climbing to get where we figured he'd be. We found him trapped in a small crevice with a broken leg. It was not pleasant. He'd been there for almost two days, and his leg was obviously infected. We were able to get him into the chopper, and I heard from one of the EMTs that the guy was absolutely inconsolable. 
we had kept talking about how he'd been doing fine, and when he'd gotten to the, to the top, a man had been there. He said the guy had no equipment, and he was wearing a parka and ski pants. He walked up to the guy, and when the guy turned around, he said he had no face. It was just blank. He freaked out and ended up trying to get off the mountain too fast, which is why he'd fallen. He said he could hear the guy all night climbing the mountain and letting out those horrible, muffled screams. That story bothered the hell out of me. I'm glad I wasn't there to hear it. One of the scariest things I've ever happened to me involved the search of a young woman who'd gotten herself separated from her hiking group. We were out until late last night because the dogs had picked up her scent, and when we found her, she was curled up under a large rotted log. She was missing her shoes, her pack, and was clearly in shock. She didn't have any injuries, and we were able to get her to walk with us back to base ops. Along the way, she kept looking behind us and asking why that man with the black eyes was following us. We couldn't see anyone, so we just wrote it off as some weird symptom of shock. But the closer we got to the base, the more agitated this woman got. She kept asking me to tell him to stop making faces at her. At one point, she stopped and turned around and started yelling into the forest saying that she wanted him to leave her alone. She wasn't going to go with him, she said, and she wouldn't give us to him. We finally got her to keep moving, but we started hearing these weird noises coming from all around us. It was almost like coughing, but more rhythmic and deeper. It was almost insect-like. I don't really know how else to describe it, when we were within sight of base ops, the woman turns to me and her eyes are about as wide as I can imagine a human could open them. She touches my shoulder and says, he says to tell you to speed up. He doesn't like looking at the scar on your neck. I have a very small scar on the base of my neck, but it's mostly hidden under my collar. I have no idea how this woman saw it. Right after she says it, I hear a weird coughing right in my ear, and I just about jumped out of my skin. I, hus I hustled her to Ops, trying not to show how freaked out I was. But I have to say, I was really happy when we left that area that night. This is the last one I'll tell, and it's probably the weirdest story I have. Now, I don't know if this is true in every SAR unit, but in mine, it's sort of an unspoken, regular thing we run into. You can try asking about it with other SAR officers, but if they know what you're talking about, they probably won't say anything about it. We've been told not to talk about it by any of our superiors, and at this point, we've all gotten so used to it that it doesn't seem weird anymore. On just about every case where we're regularly really far into the wilderness, I'm talking 30 or 40 miles, at some point we'll find a staircase in the middle of the woods. It's almost like you took the house, cut them out, and put them in a forest. I asked about them for when the first time I saw them, and the other officer just told me not to worry about it, that it was normal. Everyone I asked said the same thing. I wanted to go check them out, but I was told, very empathetically, that I should never go near any of them. I just sort of ignore them now when I run into them, because it happens so frequently. I have a lot more stories, and I suppose if anyone is interested, I'll tell them tomorrow. If anyone has any theory about the stairs, or you've just seen them too, please, let me know. So I logged back on the night and was 
blown away by the staggering amount of interest this seems to have generated. First off, I'll address a few things that you guys have brought up. There's been an overwhelming amount of people mentioning the similarity between some of my stories and those of David Polities. I assure you I'm not trying to rip him off in any way. I've got nothing but respect for the guy. He's actually what inspired me to write this, because I can verify a lot of the things that he talks about. We do have a lot of these strange missing persons cases, and most of the time they aren't solved. Either that, or we find them in places that they have no business being in. I personally haven't been on many calls like that, but I'll share a few that I've seen and a story my old friend that relates to this. There was a lot of feedback about the stairs, so I'll touch on that briefly here, and I'll also include a story. They come in a variety of shapes, sizes, styles, and conditions. Some are pretty dilapidated, just in ruins, but others are brand new. I saw one set that looked like they came from a lighthouse. They were metal and spiral, almost old-fashioned. The stairs don't go up infinitely, or farther than I can see, but some sets are just taller than others. Like I said before, just imagine the stairs in your house as if someone cut and pasted them in the middle of nowhere. I don't have any pictures. It's never really occurred to me to try again after the first time, and I don't really like risking my job over it. I'll try again in, in the future, but I can't really promise anything. A few people expressed confusion about the guy who ran into the man with no face, just to clarify, when the climber ascended and reached the top of the peak, he saw another man in a parka and ski pants. This was the man with no face. Sorry about the confusing wording of that story, I'll try to avoid that in the future. Alright, on with new stories. Okay, so, as far as missing persons go, I'd say about half the calls I get are related to that. The others are rescue calls. People who fall down cliffs and hurt themselves, get injured by fire, you wouldn't believe how often this happens, mostly drunk kids, get bitten or stung by animals or insects. We're a tight team, and we have veterans who are excellent at finding signs of lost people. That's what makes these cases where we never find any trace of them so frustrating. One in particular was upsetting for all of us, because we did find a trace of them, but it led us to more questions than answers. An older man had been ha hiking alone on a well-established trail, but his wife called to say that he hadn't come home when he should have. Apparently, he had a history of seizures, and she was worried that he hadn't taken his medication and had suffered one out on the trail. Before you ask, I have no idea why he thought it was okay to go out alone, or why she didn't go with him. I don't ask about that kind of thing because, past a certain point, it doesn't really matter. Someone is missing and it's my job to find them. We went out in a standard search formation, and it wasn't long before one of our vets found signs that the guy had gone off the trail. We grounded up and followed him, spreading out in a fan to make sure we were covering as much ground as possible. Suddenly, a call comes over the radio telling us to all head back to the vet's location and to come right away, because this usually means the missing person is injured and we need a full team to help get them out safely. We met back up and the vet is just standing at the base of the tree with his hands on his side of his head. I ask my buddy what's going on, and he points up to the branches of the tree. I almost couldn't believe what I was seeing, but there's a walking stick dangling from a branch at least 30 feet off the ground. 
The little strap thing on the handle had been looped around the branch, and it's just hanging there. There's no way the guy could have tossed it up that far, and we don't see any other signs that he's still in the area. We call up the, into the tree, but it's obvious no one's in it. We're all just sort of left scratching our heads. We keep searching for the guy, but we never find him. We even bring our canines out, but they lose his scent before the tree. Eventually, the search is called off, because there are other calls that we have to attend to. And past a certain point, there's not much we can do. The guy's wife called us every day for months, asking if we found her husband, and it was heartbreaking to hear her get more and more hopeless each time. I'm not sure why this call in particular was so upsetting, but I think it was just the sheer improbability of it. That and the question that were raised, how the hell did that guy's cane end up there? Did someone kill him and toss that up there like some weird trophy? We did our best to find him, but it was almost like a taunt. We still talk about that one from time to time. Missing kids are the most heartbreaking. It doesn't matter what circumstances they go missing under, it's never easy. And we always, always dread the ones we find deceased. It's not common, but it does happen. David Polides talks about kids' SAR teams find places they shouldn't be or couldn't be. I can honestly say I've heard about this kind of thing happening more than I've seen it, but I'll share one of these stories that I think about a lot and that I witnessed personally. A mother and her three kids were out for a picnic in the area of the park that has a small lake. One is six, one is five, and the other is about three. She's watching them all really closely, and according to her, she never lets them out of her sight at any time. She never saw anyone else in the area either, which is important. She packs up their stuff, and they start to head back into the parking area. Now, this lake is only about two miles into the woods, and is on a very clearly established trail. It's almost impossible to get lost getting from the parking area to it unless you're deliberately going off the path like an imbecile. Her kids are walking in front of her when she hears a sound what someone would say. It sounds like someone's coming up the path behind her. She turns around, and in the four or so seconds she's not looking, her five-year-old son vanishes, and she figures he'd step off the trail to pee. And... She asks her other two kids where he went. They both tell her that a big man with a scary face comes out of the woods next to them, took the kid's hand, and led him into the trees. The two remaining kids don't seem upset. In fact, she says later that it seems like they've been drugged. They're sort of spacey and fuzzy, so of course she freaks out starts to look frantically in the area for her kid. She screams his name, and she says at one point she thinks she hears him answer. Now obviously, she can't go blindly running into the woods. She's got the two other kids. So she calls the police, and they send us out immediately. We respond, and when we search the area for him, over the course of the search, which spans miles, we never find a single trace of the kid. Canines can't pick up any scent, we don't find any clothing or broken bushes or literally anything that would signify a child being there. Of course, there's suspicion about them for a while, but it's pretty clear that she's completely destroyed by the whole thing. We look for this kid for weeks, with a lot of volunteer help, but eventually the search peters out and we have to move on. The volunteers keep searching, though... And one day we got a call on the radio letting us know that a body has been found and needs to be recovered. They tell us the location and none of us can believe it. We figure it has to be a different kid, but 
We go out there, about 15 miles from the site he had vanished, and sure enough, we find the body of the kid we've been looking for. I've been trying to figure this out, how this kid got to where he did when ever since we found him, and I've never come up with an answer. A volunteer just happened to be in the area, because he figured he might as well look in places no one else thinks to on the off chance the body had been dumped. He comes to the base of a tall rocky slope, and halfway up he sees something. He looks through his binoculars and sure enough, it's the body of a little boy, stuffed in a little opening in the rock. He recognizes the color of the kid's shirt, so he knows right away that it's the missing boy. When he calls it in, we were dispatched. It took us almost an hour to get this body down, and none of us could believe what we were seeing. Not only was this kid 15 miles from where he'd started, there was no possible way he could have gotten up there on his own. This slope is treacherous, and it's hard even for us with our climbing gear. A five-year-old boy had no way of getting up there. Of that, I'm certain. Not only that, but the kid doesn't have a scratch on him. His shoes are gone, but his feet aren't damaged or dirty. So it wasn't as if an animal dragged him up there. And from what we can tell, he hasn't been dead that long. He'd been out there for over a month by that point, and it looked like he'd only been dead for almost a day or two. The whole thing was unbelievably strange, and was one of the most disconcerting calls I've ever been on. We found out later that the coroner determined that the kid had died from exposure. He'd frozen to death probably late at night, two days before we found him. There were no suspects and no answers. To date, it's one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. One of my first jobs as a, as a trainee was a search op for a four-year-old that had gotten separated from his mom. This was one of those cases where we knew we were going to find him because the dogs had a strong scent trail. and. We saw clear signs that he was in the area. We ended up finding him in a berry patch about half a mile from where he'd been last seen. The kid wasn't even aware that he'd wandered off that far. One of the vets brought him back, which I was glad for because I'm not really good with kids, and I find it hard to talk to them and keep them company. As my trainer and I are headed back, she decides to take me on a detour to show me one of the hot spots where we tend to find missing people. It's a natural dip in the land near a popular trail, and people will usually move downhill because it's easier. We hike out there, it's a few miles away, and we get there in about an hour or so. As we're walking around the area, and she pointing out, you know, places she's found people in the past, I see something in the distance. Now, this area we're in is about eight miles from the main parking area. Though, there's back roads you can take to get closer if you want, if you don't want to hike that far. But we're on state protected land, which means they're can't be any kind of commercial or residential development out there. The most you'll ever see is a fire tower or makeshift shelter that homeless people think they can get away with building. But I can see from here that whatever this thing is has straight edges. And if there's one thing you learn quickly, it's that nature rarely makes straight lines. I point it out, but she doesn't say anything. She just hangs back and lets me wander over and check it out. I get within about 20 feet of it, and all the hair on the back of my neck stands up. It's a staircase. In the middle of the fucking woods. 
In the proper context, it would literally be the most benign thing ever. It's just, it's just a normal staircase, with beige carpet and about 10 steps tall. But in the house, where it obviously should be, it's out here in the middle of the woods. The sides aren't carpeted, obviously. And I can see the wood it's made of. It's almost like a video game glitch, where the house had failed to load completely, and the stairs are the only thing visible. I stand there, and it's like my brain is working overtime to try and make sense of what I'm seeing. My trainer comes and stand ne stands next to me, and she just stands there casually, looking at it as if it's the least interesting thing in the world. I hear, what the fuck is this doing here? And she just chuckles. Get used to it, rookie. You're going to see a lot of them. I start to move closer, but she grabs my arm. Hard. I wouldn't do that, she says. Her voice is casual, but her grip is tight. And I just stand there looking at her. You're going to see them all the time, but don't go near them. Don't touch them. Don't go up to them. Just ignore them. I start to ask her about it, but something in the way she's looking at me tells that it's best if I don't. We end up moving on, and the subject doesn't come up again for the rest of my training. She was right, though. I'd say about every fifth call I go on, I end up running across a set of stairs. Sometimes they're relatively close to the path, maybe within two or three miles. Sometimes they're 20, 30 miles out. Literally in the middle of nowhere. And I only find them during the broadest searches or training weekends. They're usually in good condition, but sometimes it looks like they've been out there for a while. All different kinds, all different sizes, the biggest I ever saw looked like they came out of a turn-of-the-century mansion, and they were at least 10 feet wide with steps leading up at least 15 or 20 steps. I've tried talking about it with people, but they just give me the same response my trainer did. It's normal. Don't worry about it. They're not a big deal, but don't go close to them or up them. When trainees ask me about it now, I give them the same response. I don't really know what else to tell them. I'm really hoping someday I get a better answer, but it hasn't happened yet. This is another one that was less spooky and more sad. A young man went missing late in winter, when realistically no one should be going out that far onto the trails. We close a lot of them, but some remain open year-round, unless there's a shitload of snow. We didn't opt for them, but we had about six feet of snow on the ground. It was an unusually heavy snow year. And we knew it wasn't likely that we'd find them until spring, when, you know, it, when, when, when the thaw came. But sure enough, when the first big thaw came, a hiker reported a body a little ways off the main trail. We found him at least at the base of a tree, in a pile of melted snow. We knew right away what had happened, and it scared the living shit out of me. Most of you who ski or snowboard or spend any amount of time on a mountain will probably have guessed it too. When snow falls, it doesn't collect as thick in areas beneath the branches. It happens most with uh, fear trees, because they have a sort of closed umbrella shape. So what you end up with is a space around the base of a tree that's filled with mixture of loose powdery snow, air, and branches. They are called tree wells, and they're not immediately obvious if you don't know what you're looking for. We put signs in the welcome center 
big ones, letting know, letting people know how dangerous they are. But every year that we get an unusual amount of snow, at least one person doesn't read them or doesn't take the warning seriously. And we find out about it in spring. My best guess is that this young man was hiking and got tired, or maybe a cramp from walking in the deep snow. He went to go sit at the base of a tree, not knowing that there was a tree well, and fell in. He got stuck with his feet up, and the surrounding snow caved in around him. Unable to free himself, he suffocated. It's called snow immersionification, and it doesn't usually happen except in really deep snow. But if you get stuck in a weird position like this guy did, even six feet of snow can be lethal. What scared me the most was imagining how he must have struggled. Upside down, in the freezing cold, he didn't die quickly. The snow would have formed a dense, heavy pile on top of him and it would have been literally impossible to get out. As it got harder to breathe, he would have known what was happening. I can't even imagine what he was thinking in his last moments. A lot of my less outdoorsy friends want to know if I've ever seen the goat man while I've been out on calls. Unfortunately, or I guess fortunately, I've never had anything quite like that happen. I guess the closest was, let's see, the whole black-eyed man thing. But I didn't see anything. However, there was there was one call where I had something kind of similar happen, but I'm not sure I'm willing to chalk it up to the goat man. We'd gotten a report that an older woman had fainted along one of the trails and needed, needed assistance getting back down to the main area. We hike up where to where she's at, and her husband is just beside himself. He runs, well, I guess more jogs, to us, and tells us that he was a little ways off the trail looking at something when his wife starts screaming behind him. He runs back to her, and she's passed out on the trail. We get her on a backboard, and as we're getting her down to the welcome center, she comes to and starts screaming again. I calm her down and ask her what happened. I can't remember verbatim what she said, but essentially what happened was this. She had been waiting for her husband when she started hearing this really strange sound. She said it sort of sounded like a cat, but was somehow off, and she couldn't quite figure out why. She went a little ahead to try and hear it, and it sounded like it was coming closer. She said the closer it got, the more uneasy she was, until she finally figured out what was wrong. I do remember this next part, because it was so weird that I don't think I could forget if I tried. It wasn't a cat. It was a man saying the word meow over and over again. Just meow, meow, meow. But it wasn't a man. It couldn't have been. Because I've never heard of a man make his voice buzz like that. I thought my hearing aid was going out, but it wasn't. I adjusted it, and it still sounded all buzzy. It was awful. He was coming closer, but I couldn't see him. And the closer he got, the more scared I was. And the last thing I remember was a shape coming out of the trees. I guess that's when I fainted. Now, obviously, I'm a little perplexed as to why a guy would be out in the fucking woods chanting meow, meow at people. So, once we get down the mountain, I tell my superior that I'm going to go search the area to see if I can find anything. 
He gives me the go-ahead, and I grab a radio and hike back to where she'd fainted. I don't see anyone, so I keep going about a mile or more, and when I head back, I go off the trail to see if I can figure out where she saw him coming from. It's almost sunset by this point, and I don't have any desire to be out at night alone, so I just sort of write it off and make a mental note to check it out again tomorrow. But as I'm headed back, I start to hear something in the distance. I stop and call out for anyone in the immediate area to identify themselves. The sound didn't come closer or get louder, but it sounded like a man saying meow, meow, in this really odd monotone. As comical as it may sound, it was almost like the guy on South Park with the electrolarynx, Ned. I go off the trail in the direction I think it's coming from, but I never see him to get closer. It's almost like it's coming from all directions. Eventually it just sort of fades out and I end up going back to the welcome center. I didn't get any further reports like that, and even though I went back to that area, I never heard that exact sound again. I suppose it could have been some stupid kid out there fucking with people, but even I have to admit, it was weird. So this kind of turned into a massive wall of text, and for that I apologize. I wanted to get to the stories my friend told me, and he does have some good ones. I'll post those tomorrow evening. I'll also have a few more of my own I think you guys like. Uh, I'm sorry to keep you spend Hopefully the stories here make up for it and help you get through the next 24 hours until I can post it again. Since it seems like all of you would like to hear tomorrow, I'll write up as many stories as I can and do a massive post. I'll include my friend's stories and I'll see if I can get a hold of a few more people who might have interesting things to talk about. I just wasn't sure how people felt about big huge walls of text, but I hope you're okay with it. I'll post lots of stories.